Hey, it's Streams in the Desert. Praise the Lord. I kind of took a look at what the title was, and all my devotionals are talking about the gospel. So, let's talk about the gospel. You know, one of the things I need to communicate, you know, sometimes and share, is some of the misconceptions and the preconceived ideas that people say, oh, you can't do this, or you can't do that, or God doesn't do that. You know, and... They lay such a heavy trip on God that, you know, until someone like me comes along that argues with theologians, contradicts, sometimes maybe even your pastor, but just stands up for God and says, hey, you know what? The Lord our God in the midst of us is mighty, and if he chooses to do something, you know, he can do it. Now, I'm not saying he's going to do gold dust. Come on now, that's a parlor trick. You know it and I know it. Let's get real. And I'm not saying that he's going to, you know, bark like a dog, you know, and roll around on the floor. Sorry, that's people getting a little carried away and getting carried off and carried over and <laughs> emotionally unstable, so to speak. Because God works in a miraculous way, it's true, and you should fall down on your face when you get to heaven, but in the meantime, I don't need to practice rolling around on the floor in order to recognize the holiness of God. But for the gospel's sake, you know, sometimes... God chooses to go out of his way to do things nobody ever thought of in order to share salvation of the soul, in order to save to the uttermost, to do all that he can in order to bring salvation to a person. How do I know? Jesus died. Let's get real. How insane is that? God dying? Deicide? That's absurd. Why would God go out of his way to die for you? I mean, <laughs> you looked at you lately? Thank God God loves you. Nobody else does. <laughs> nobody else did, and nobody else will love you like he does. But I wanted to destroy a myth. So let me get off my high horse for a minute. Let me get off my pedestal. Let me get off my soapbox. You getting the picture yet about what I'm talking about? And let me go over here and get my Bible. That's always a good place to be. Ugh, got my Bible, so let me crawl back on my high horse. Let me get back up on my pedestal. Let me stand on my soapbox. If, let's be real. If God so chooses, this is what's happened in my life. Now, you ain't going to like this next part, so can I give you a hint? Close your eyes, close your ears, zip of the lip. Because this is what happened. There are people in my personal experience of life that I have gone to specifically, that I was worried about emotionally, that I cared so much that I would pray for them God, work on them. God, save them. God, I want them to be saved. And so God would say, I am going to speak to them. Go. And then I'd go, Lord, pick him. Pick them. Pick those. Anything, but don't pick me. You go. Was that a car? <laughs> no, you, Michael, go. So, I'd grab my, this Bible? Of course not. I'd grab my Bible, so let me crawl off my high horse again. Let me crawl off my established means of God working in a certain theological predication that we only do it by way of according to what he says in his word, and that God can't work outside of his word because he already said his word, so he's not going to do anything except in the word. Right? I would grab my Bible because God was going to talk to somebody. And God only knows what's going to happen. And I would come to them and I'd say, look, I don't know you. You don't know me that well. And you sure don't know God, do you? No. Well, 
This is the Bible. God can speak to you through the Bible. Now, I don't know what's on your mind, and I'm just coming here to tell you that God wants you to know that He's real. God is real. Let me tell you that personally. I know He's real. You don't know He's real. Try this. Prove it. Jesus Himself said that He would reveal Himself to anyone that asks, to anyone that seeks, that if they did, they would find Him. So I'm here to tell you, because I've been praying for you a long time now, that this may be, the way I look at it, your last chance. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't want to know. I really don't. Because, frankly, I think that once God speaks to you, you're going to have to deal with Him personally on a one-to-one -one basis. And, you know, I don't know how you're going to react to that. You know, you might get mad at me. You know, you might, you know, accept the fact that God spoke to you. That's all I want to know. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to just simply pray whatever's the first thing on your mind right now. Remember it. Write it down if you have to. But in your mind, think about what's going on, the most important issue you're facing right now in your life. Okay? And then you go, how did he know that I have something I'm facing right now really important? But he doesn't know what it is, so, okay. So they would usually, you know, because they were in crisis, and God always sent me to people that were in crisis at the time, for those people that I'm talking about. And they would take my Bible and I'd say, now, here's what I want you to do. Go in the other room, say a prayer, flip open the Bible anywhere you want, and read right there. As soon as you know that God is speaking to you, come back in and just tell me that God spoke to you. That's all I want to know. Because whatever he tells you, that's between you and him. But God does not work in coincidence. He doesn't do things by happenstance. There is no such thing as karma. God operates in the circumstances of your life, and he's brought me here today to meet with you today so that he could find you, and you could talk to him, and you could deal with him on a personal way. So from that moment on, you can't deny that there is a God, but the reality is that you will prove to yourself, by yourself, whether there is a God or not. So... Guess what happened? They'd go in there, they'd go, whatever they prayed, however they prayed, they might have gone, who knows, maybe I'll just don't even know, whatever. Or they might have gone, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they would flip open the Bible. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile, what shall I answer thee? And whatever it is that they read at the time, not only spoke to them, they cried. They came back in. They were in tears, literally, looking at me like I was whatever, and I'm not. And I would be like, that's God. And usually had an extra Bible, you know, and gave it to them. Maybe not a King James, who knows, might have been at the time. Could have been any Bible, I don't care. But you see, at that moment in time, they needed to hear from God. They were in that moment where God told me to go and share with them so that flipping open a Bible was a good thing for them at the time. It was the circumstances of their life had been so arranged that God took me and sent me as his messenger, figure that one out, to share with them his word so that at that moment in time they would be communicating with God. Now, that didn't happen once or twice or three times. That happened a lot. And... There's also kind of a sad part to it. So I'll tell you the sad part first. The sad part about sharing the gospel in that way was that they would say at the moment, yes, God spoke to me. Some of them, and I'll say the majority of them, after a day or two would come back and say, God never spoke to me. No. Uh-uh. And... I wouldn't see them for, matter of fact, one person I just saw on the internet recently, and it had been probably 10 or 15 years. They turned their back on the living God and walked away. Because you see, the good seed goes into good ground and it grows and does all like Jesus said, and the seed that goes into, you know, stony ground gets trampled upon, you know, and that Sometimes the sun beats on it, you know, and there's no root. And 
some of the seed sometimes, you know, goes into, you know, a fertile ground and bears much fruit. But there's also another thing that happened that once a demon or once a householder has been cleansing his house and everything's been removed, it's said that that demon would be cast out and that he would go out into the world and he would travel about and he would find seven demons that were more wicked than he was and he would come back to see what nature that house was in. Had it been cleansed and protected and fortified? Because if it hadn't, then those demons would come in and torment that person. And the reality of what I saw was many times after God had sent me to share with a person directly like that, that scripture would come to mind when they hated me for weeks or months, maybe even years. I committed them in prayer and then left it there because there was a time when I even told the Lord, I'm not sharing the gospel. I'm not telling people about Jesus. Uh-uh, not if that's what the results are. Because, you see, the reality of a person knowing God isn't about thousands of people coming to Jesus. Because anybody can put on a crusade and stand up there and give a message and see people come. The reality of making a disciple of Jesus is being willing to die for that person and hurt for them and cry for them. Praying that one day they would come into a knowledge of God himself. But they have the freedom of choice. And they can go either way. And it's not for us to determine when or if they don't come back someday in the future. And for me, many of the people, I can tell you, praise the Lord, that in my sharing in that way, I've shared the gospel in the normal ways and done all the normal stuff, you know, four spiritual laws and the Roman road and all the other garbage that's out there to teach you, how do you share God? But uh, in those particular moments, which was very real, very personal, um, a lot of those people came back to God later in their own way, though the stony ground obviously had been smashed up by God's confrontation in their life. He had intervened in a direct way, much as he does with Paul, and he did when he knocked him off his horse. So I hope you don't have to get knocked off your high horse, you know, about how you share the gospel or about what you share with Jesus or about what you think you need to do. Because there's really no one set way. There's nothing that says, hey, you know what? You got to do it this way. You got to wait for a woman to come to a well, and then when everybody's not around, you know, you got to witness to that prostitute or that pole dancer or that stripper, you know, because after all, then when your fellow believers would come up, you know, and then they're going to wonder, why are you talking to that kind of woman, you know, when you should be witnessing to all those that are dressed right and talk right and look right? No, there's no set pattern, there's no set way. The only thing you need to do and say is share what Jesus has put there. What is inside you? What has God done for you? What is your testimony? What is your way of doing the gospel? Streams in the desert. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You know, I think about that. What kind of reputation do you really need to have? to share the gospel. Do you have to have a THD? Do you have to go to the Billy Graham School of Evangelism? Do you have to have the 12 you know, step program of discipleship? Do you have to have the 10 week studies of baby believers? What do you have to do to share Jesus? The truth is in the Jesus movement, we didn't need anything. We didn't do anything. As a matter of fact, most of the times that when the churches were growing, phenomenally, it was with people that really didn't know what they were doing. I don't know, but I love Jesus, so I'm just going to play my guitar and praise the Lord. <laughs> and talk about Jesus as I'm reading them in the Bible. Well, this looks like it says, you know, believe me, there were some pretty wacky ideas in those days. Pretty strange. And pretty right on. And some of those men of God went on to be pretty right on men of God now. <laughs> but there were times, it's some pretty strange ideas. They were living to themselves, self with its hopes and promises and dreams still had hold of them. But the Lord began to fulfill their prayers. They had asked for contrition 
and had surrendered for it to be given them at any cost. And he sent them sorrow. They had asked for purity, and he sent them thrilling anguish. They had asked to be meek, and he had broken their hearts. They had asked to be dead to the world, and he slew all their living hopes. They had asked to be made like unto him, and he placed them in the furnace, sitting by as a refiner and purifier of silver until they should reflect his image. They had asked to lay hold of his cross, and when he had reached it to them, it cut their hands. They had asked they knew not what, nor how. But he had taken them at their word and granted them all their petitions. They were and hardly willing to follow him so far or to draw so nigh to him. They had upon them an awe and fear as Jacob at Bethel or Eliphaz in the night visions or as the apostles when they thought that they had seen a spirit and they knew not that it was Jesus. They could almost pray him to depart from them or to hide his awfulness as he appeared to them. They found it easier to obey than to suffer, to do than to give up, to bear the cross than to hang upon it. But they cannot go back, for they have come too near to the unseen cross, and its virtues have pierced too deeply within them. He is fulfilling to them all his promise, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. But now at last their turn has come. Before they had only heard of the mystery, but now they feel it. He has fastened on them his look of love, as he did on Mary, and on Peter, and they can but choose only to follow. Little by little, from time to time, by fleeting dreams, the mystery of his cross shines out upon them. They behold him lifted up. They gaze on the glory which raised from the wounds of his holy passion. And as they gaze upon him, they advance. And as they come forward, they are changed into his likeness. And his name shines out through them, for he dwells in them. They live alone with him above, in unspeakable fellowship, willing to lack what others own that they might have had, but gave up in order to own him and have nothing else but the likeness of his image. And to be unlike all, so that they are only like him. Such are they in all ages, who follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests, but nowhere has the Son of Man to lay his hand. Had they chosen for themselves, or their friends chosen for them, they would have chosen otherwise. They would have been brighter here, but less glorious in his kingdom. They would have had Lot's portion, not Abraham's. If they had halted anywhere, if God had taken off his hand and let them stray back, what would they not have lost? What forfeits in the resurrection? But he stayed them up even against themselves. Many a time their foot had nigh well slipped, but he in mercy held them up. Now, even in this life, they know not at all he did what's done well. They do not know what they do, whether they do so well or not. It was good to suffer here, that they might reign hereafter, to bear the cross below, for they shall wear the crown above. And that not their will, but his was done on them, in them, through them, and with them. I almost want to cry when I read those words, for I think of I, myself. When I got saved, I made a choice. And I found the devotional that told me others may, but you may not. Others can have great ministries and great great mighty works and write books and do all kinds of things to be mighty. And I chose another way. A quieter way. A behind the scenes way. A humble way. And it was a choice, and God honored it. Occasionally, once in a rare glimpse of 
the earth parting and heaven opening up, I see what cost there was to bear, that I should be able to experience the things that I have enjoyed with God alone. And at times I leave my heart there and I, I find reward for that which I have lost here. But sometimes, like any man of flesh that I am, oh, I wish there were the accolades of those that would cry out, oh, Michael, you man of God. Michael, such a good word. Michael, you know so much. Michael, you remind us of Jesus. And like any man of God, I would glory in nothing less than to say it's only in Jesus that we find our salvation. For it has nothing to do with I, for I know who and what I am. But because I know who he is and what he has done, because I know how he loves and how he works. Oh, I would not give up all that I've lost. For I have counted the cost. And I ask that you would do the same. Before you claim in the name of Jesus to go out in his name and to do the work that you think that God has called you to do. I pray you count the cost. For it is nothing less than dying that Jesus may live.